a small team of hackers in Southern California who write for Nullbyte, and we also consult for businesses occasionally on uh, issues that they have, and try to just make the world generally a better and more secure place. Um, some of those speakers, uh, some of my speakers today are also from that team. So for myself, I am a Wi-Fi hacker, social engineer, and uh, open source intelligence and human intelligence researcher. Uh, I've worked at startups to organize processes and in business development roles. So uh, today, uh, a lot of people ask what Wi-Fi hacking is, and there's actually a number of different things that can, we can be talking about when we're talking about Wi-Fi hacking. Uh, one of them is just gaining access to the network password. That's kind of what most people think about. But there's also tricking users into connecting to a fake network that looks like a real network. Uh, we can also pivot into a Wi-Fi network based on another network device like a printer that has like an open network. And finally, we can use some flaws in Wi-Fi chips to exploit devices that basically people don't have any choice in. You, you really don't have much you can do about this sort of thing other than turning the Wi-Fi on your device off. So when people hack Wi-Fi, it's always for a reason. People don't just hack for no reason. Uh, sometimes people just need free Wi-Fi. Uh, other times they want direct access to home and work computers uh, and all the devices attached. So as soon as you join a Wi-Fi network, you have a lot of things you can do on the network. You can manipulate traffic. You can choose to kind of like to explore the network and find out what devices are attached, if they're vulnerable, and start kind of uh, doing things with a flow of information between those devices. Uh, another one is the ability to hijack uh, police drones, IP cameras, and other infrastructure that we rely on in order to pipe critical information. You can either disrupt those or you can actually tap into them and start uh, doing things like you know, hijacking drones and telling them to do stuff they shouldn't be doing, or watching the feed on security cameras you shouldn't be able to watch. Uh, the ability to monitor user devices and when users come and go. A lot of people know that you can hack Wi-Fi and not a lot of people know that you don't need to necessarily when it comes to being able to monitor uh, whether a user is home or not, for example, who is uh, in the area with them. If you needed to keep tabs on someone and you didn't know their Wi-Fi password, it doesn't really matter because you can still detect the devices when they're in the area and when they're associated with the network. So uh, corporations and other like uh, government agencies use this kind of information regularly to track you when you're in a store when you're making purchases, like where you kind of like go within there. Uh, and generally seek to understand how people move uh, by recording where their phones are, which uh, can also lead to things like uh, just generally tracking people who haven't consented to being tracked in kind of like warrantless searches. So relaying criminal VPN traffic is a problem. If you have somebody breach your network, any kind of uh, traffic originating from your, net from your network seems to be from you. So if somebody wanted to email the vice president with a bunch of death threats, it would seem to come from your address. And that's something that people have done. People have done some very bizarre things. And if you guys have ever heard of swatting, uh, that's a tactic where people pretend to do a 911 call or otherwise uh, originate an uh, emergency call or some sort of like, disaster call from a specific IP address or a specific phone number so that the SWAT team comes in an effort to actually just attack the person who really owns it. Um, so. This can also be escalated because if you're on the network, you can also appear to be uh, an employee or somebody else who's authorized, and that can cause problems for anybody who's trying to restrict access to their network. Um, if you can, for example, seemingly send an email from the owner of the company to uh, business partners and ask them to you know, do something like deposit money into a sketchy account, like that can be a real problem for, for an organization that's based on trust. So what is at stake when your Wi-Fi is compromised? Well, a lot of people don't really care. Some of them even leave their Wi-Fi open, which is really funny because it's not a good idea. Uh, in fact, anything that you do on a Wi-Fi network, if somebody gets your password later, if they were recording it at the time, and let's say they, they were doing it for months, they could go back and decrypt all that traffic later once they get the password. So surveillance isn't mon just kind of limited to what people can get after they get your password. They can actually be in place a while before. And if you're doing a, what's called a penetration test, which is when a, a professional team of researchers would go in and kind of test for these things, one thing you would do is uh, be persistent. You would go on site and begin to record information before you necessarily have the ability to decrypt it because you know later on you could have user passwords already. You could have stuff in plain text. The only thing you need is really the next step, which is just getting the password, which can come later on. Um, so you don't know how long your information might have been recorded. And once your password is breached, that information is out there. So uh, all traffic may also be manipulated and changed by an attacker, including diverting to real-looking fake login sites to steal passwords. This is called phishing. Uh, a number of members of our team are very familiar with this. 
And the way that it works is when you try to go to a real website, somebody on your network will route you instead to a real looking website that will steal your credentials, relay them, and then log you back into your site as though nothing happened. Most people don't notice it. It's a very small disruption and everybody's been kicked out of their Facebook or something once or twice. Sometimes that may be what that is. So uh, routers can also be converted to spy on you. And this is something that the CIA does. It's something that the government is really into because they don't need to put a spy device on your network. They just create one out of your router. Now, your router is a Linux computer. It has a little operating system. It does different things. And you can tell it to do things other than what it was intended to do. It stresses it out, but it can handle it. So what the CIA has done, for example, is create something called Cherry Tree, which is a really interesting system that turns the router into a rogue device. So rather than sitting around and spying on people, why don't you just turn their router into a device that will do your work for you? So uh, another issue is, again, criminal traffic may be associated with you. It is actually super profitable to route criminal VPN, like credit card, like, a, like stolen credit cards, like checking to see if they're valid. Like that kind of traffic often will flow through VPN networks that are through compromised Wi-Fi networks. So if the FBI shows up and wants to know why you're carding so many uh, people and to please stop stealing credit cards, it could be because you just left your Wi-Fi password uh, to something like that. So uh, ransomware can also take over your network. Uh, a lot of these new modules like WannaCry actually have hunter modules where if you join a network and you are infected, it will find every device on the network that is also infected and spread to it. So the security of Wi-Fi is a real concern. If you run something like a school, a hospital, a police station, anywhere where records are critical to the operation of what you're doing, this kind of stuff can destroy your business. Uh, so what kind of criminal masterminds can actually defeat Wi-Fi? Uh, this is Betsy Davis. Uh, she is, I believe, seven years old. And she, crack, she hacked into Wi-Fi in 11 minutes. So when we look at the kind of people who can get started and start doing these kinds of attacks in the real world, there is literally no barrier to entry anymore. Um, children can do it. Angry neighbors can do it. Techno criminals can do it. That's people that you know use technology to commit crimes, but they're not so good at coding. Like they use credit card scammers, stuff like that. Attractive women with large breasts are very, very good at this. They walk in and they ask for the Wi-Fi password, and it's the easiest way to get it because people don't like to say no to them. So often we get off on all these technical details of how to hack Wi-Fi and it does not matter because you can just send somebody that the person who administers the Wi-Fi, something they have in common, send somebody that's willing to talk to them, someone who makes the rules seem not so important because giving out the Wi-Fi password is a very, very common thing to do. And even if the rules are to not do so, if you like someone, chances are you will do it. Um, college students with bad credit and bad grades frequently will hack into their schools uh, grading system and change their grades. Uh, criminal syndicates targeting specific businesses, nation states targeting infrastructure, security researchers like myself wanting to get paid, and robots will all do these things. So uh, this is a really handy way of kind of classifying the real world drugs that are out there. I'm borrowing this from uh, ATP hacking. Uh, but this kind of explains the different categories of people that would do this kind of attack fit into. We have unsophisticated threats, unsophisticated persistent threats, smart threats, smart persistent threats, advanced threats, and finally advanced persistent threats. So the difference between those, uh, first we have unsophisticated threats, and those are people that are not very good at this. Um, they take a long time to learn. They need stuff that has been documented and out there for a while. They need stuff to click on that just does it, uh, and they don't have to really follow up on anything. We're talking about crazy dads, lazy criminals, teenagers, neighbors that are angry at you for passive aggressive stuff that want to get back at you but don't want to confront you, robots. Uh, all these things can do unsophisticated attacks. And the kind of attacks that they prefer are well-documented attacks that have been around for a long time. We're talking about things like WEP, which has been broken since 2005, uh, point and click tools, old hardware flaws, and things that have YouTube tutorials associated because it's easy to learn. So the kinds of attacks that unsophisticated threats like to use are things like WEP cracking, uh, tools like B-Side NG, Aircrack NG, and Wi-Fi. They're automated tools that require very little user interaction to out and out crack WEP networks. Now, WEP EP stands for Wireless Equivalency Equivalent Privacy, and it was kind of the first type of privacy that was implemented, and encryption that was implemented for Wi-Fi networks. It was not very good, and it was broken, again, in 2005. So if you are running a WEP network, you are opening yourself up to anybody cracking into your network. Uh, and there are tools that make this so easy that you run them, 
you walk away, you come back 15 minutes later, and if there's any WEP networks in the area, they are just, you have the password. Uh, w WPS setup pin. Uh, in older routers, there was a setup pin that could be brute forced in a number of hours. Sometimes, I think the maximum was about 14 hours. So if it had this feature, you would get into the router within 14 hours, usually sooner, but it was just a matter of time, and that's powerful. If you can say you can defeat WPA, which so far hasn't been cracked, it's a newer standard, in 14 hours or less, that means that nobody's really secure if they use this stuff. But people have gotten smart and they've started phasing this stuff out and it's much, much harder to find something that will actually be vulnerable to this nowadays. So WPA cracking. Nowadays, if you want to be able to crack WPA, which is the current standard, which kind of superseded WEP, there's one way to do it, basically. You can get a handshake, which gives you the ability to guess against a big list of passwords. And if you get it right, you know. So the speed with which you can guess a large list of passwords and the accuracy with which those passwords reflect the likelihood of it being a password. Again, if we're working off a big list of passwords that are harvested from real users that are used all the time, they're very common, we have a pretty good chance of being able to break in. We're using a bunch of random letters and stuff. It'll probably take a long time and we would need a very fast processor so we could try many, many, many guesses because we're just trying random things. By targeting things, we can kind of narrow it down and that's what we started to do with things like RockU. So RockU is a stolen list of passwords from real people. And because people tend to reuse passwords, it's kind of a thing people just do, these passwords work all the time because it contains almost every terrible password you can think of. Like the top like, million terrible passwords that people use are in this list. So if you're guilty, most of your stuff could probably be exploited by an idiot with this list. So the last is, uh, so. Going a little bit more into that, when you have this word list, all you need to do in order to attempt to crack a password is get a handshake from the network. Now, if anybody is connected to that network, if you disconnect them for just a second, you can capture the necessary information to test against this list. So you can go home after you get the, the handshake and crack for as long as you like, with as many resources as you like, and really kind of escalate this thing if it's a priority for you. So the way that WPA is vulnerable is vulnerable in a very specific way. If you choose a bad password, it is vulnerable. If you choose a password that computers can guess very well, it is vulnerable. But if you pick a very, very, very secure password that's hard for computers and people to guess and you don't tell anyone, it's still pretty good. So that's kind of the situation with WPA and why there's a lot of different attacks for it, but it's still a strong system. So the last one is social engineering. Uh, there's tools like Linset and Fluxian, which will actually uh, block the legitimate Wi-Fi network and then create a fake one and attempt to trick the user into uh, joining that one. Now that one's pretty, pretty bad because the, the fake screen looks not very believable, but a lot of people fall for it. The first time I heard of this attack, I was working in a business and the Wi-Fi went out, I connected to the same thing that just didn't have uh, any security on it and it immediately asked, told me the router was rebooting and it needed uh, the Wi-Fi password to do so. And I was like, I know exactly what this is. And I didn't know who was doing it, but I knew it was a fake password that was trying to get the, uh, it was a fake form that was trying to get the password for the Wi-Fi. So things like this are used in the wild all the time. I don't know who is responsible for that, but you will see this kind of stuff pop up. When you see the legitimate Wi-Fi suddenly go out and there's sketchy Wi-Fi right next to you that has the same name, but it's open and you're getting a weird login portal, there's probably a reason. Because it's way easier to get you to tell me the password than it is to try to cryptographically break it. Because why would I waste the processing power if you'll just tell me? So next up is smart threats, and that is what me and my team are kind of paid to simulate. Smart threats have specific skills. They contribute on what's called a red team by having kind of specific areas that they're good at. That's gonna be red teaming, uh, like social engineering, coders, like people who are good at Python, people who are good at all kinds of different aspects of IT and even breaking into buildings are going to be people that can contribute to a red team because physical access is a thing too. So the types of people uh, who tend to be smart threats are effective criminals, organizations that actually make money, hackers, advanced students, private businesses, insider threats, that's people that work for these organizations that wanna make money and they're smart enough to try to get away with it. So they typically use tools that aren't free or if they use tools that are free, they're very good at them. Uh, they used advanced frameworks uh, and tools used by professionals. They tend to use Linux-based operating systems and they use clever attacks that exploit widespread vulnerabilities. So uh, 
a couple attacks used by smart threats. One is getting personal passwords. They realized that it does not make sense to run a default password list, so we came up with things like cup.py, which is an interactive script that asks questions about the user. What is their mother's maiden name? Where did they grow up? What is their dog's name? What is the first address they live at? Anything you know about them, it will create a custom word list based on those details because people like to use their sister's birthday or their anniversary. So this will hit all of those things. So anybody that's sentimental, you just fire up this Python program and you create a customized word list that cuts down the amount of time you have to spend guessing. Then we get to cool. Cool will just scrape an entire website. If you're going after an organization, especially if they're not smart, you can scrape all the unusual words that they use, especially organizational buzzwords that they'll probably make passwords out of because they're stupid, like integrity or something like that. You can scrape all that stuff off their website and use this script to generate a custom word list just for that. So you have a better way of attacking specific organizations instead of using just a general word list. And then we get Crunch, which is a specific word mangler where we take things like Rock U and we modify them so that they become a permutation that we use leak speak and like throw in all the other stuff that people think is really clever. But in actual fact, it's not very original. And it allows us, once we kind of know maybe the format of the password or how many letters it has to be, to get pretty fucking close. So next up we have uh, cracking by GPUs. CPUs are not that great for cracking. Uh, things like CUDA and Pyrex uh, can take advantage of GPUs to significantly speed up the time that we spend cracking these passwords. When we speed up the time to which we can burn through these lists, we can use bigger lists and we can use things like rainbow tables to eventually make it so that it takes very, very little time to attack a network cryptographically. It's very intensive uh, in terms of power, in terms of cost, you have to get a cracking rig, but it's something that people who are serious about it can do to gain a real advantage in basically breaking your password. Uh, the last is distrib well, second last, distributed crackers. Uh, distributed crackers take many, many computers, distribute the work of uh, going up against your hash, uh, the, the password hash, and come back with the result very quickly. So by having a group of volunteers who are willing to run computers that crack against your password, you can basically get 50 handshakes just by grabbing as many as you possibly can submit them to the service, and then get back 10 results, and you've just reached 10 Wi-Fi networks in a matter of five minutes. So the less is paid services. If you are desperate and you are a criminal, uh, or if you just really need to get the password, there are paid services, mostly based on AWS, uh, where you can rent server space to crack passwords specifically. Next up is recon and targeting. Uh, with Wiggle Wi-Fi, you can actually locate uh, in time and space Every network that you pass by with just a smartphone, it will tell you where it's located, who makes it, the security it has, whether it's running WEP or WPA. And you can even, if you're a programmer, take the information from the script and only come up with vulnerable networks so you can go back later and exploit only the vulnerable easy ones, the low-hanging fruit. So Kismet is a way of kind of monitoring which devices are connected to networks. It's a Linux program that's kind of a, the bare bones version of Wiggle Wi-Fi. And it's something that will allow you to not only geolocate networks, but know specific information about who is connected to them, when they are connected to them, and log them over long periods of time. And finally, Probon takes advantage of the fact that cell phones put out probe frames periodically to be able to detect networks nearby that actually reveal the last several networks that they've connected to. So if you're an attacker, and you can see that somebody's recently connected to a network called Google Starbucks, you can create a fake network and know that most phones are going to automatically connect to it. Now, a brief show of hands, is anybody here connected to Google Starbucks at the moment? You wanna check your phones? One, anybody else? So when you walked in, there's actually a rogue device here that is named Google Starbucks, and since most of you have probably at some point connected to Google Starbucks, some of you might have been having trouble with your internet because it's not actually connected to anything. We're being nice, we're not actually running traffic through it. But by simply placing a network that's open that you have connected to before, your laptops and your cell phones will automatically connect to it without telling you. So I'm not providing you data, but I could be providing you bad data or malicious websites or malware or any other thing, and you would not know that because your phones took that choice away from you. They automatically connected. And the reason I could do that is because I know that you connected to it. So by doing things like listening in on programs and seeing where the people around you have not only been, but what kinds of networks they've been connecting to, you can figure out if they've been connecting to an open Wi-Fi network in an airport lounge, pop up that network, see if it connects. 
So uh, Ian's going to go into this a little bit more, but men in the middle attacks is kind of what I just described. It's uh, creating a network that does malicious things. We're not doing that today. Oh, we just created one to demonstrate. But you can create fake IPs, uh, APs, jam real IPs, and force the user to switch to a rogue device. Devices like the Wi-Fi Pineapple are designed to, designed to seek out, clone, and then uh, replicate uh, these wireless networks that you are kind of trying to take over and trick the user into connecting to that network rather than the legitimate one in order to do all these nefarious things. Tools like MDK3 and WiFiJammer.py will actually operate as software-based Wi-Fi jammers and completely take out Wi-Fi, including any devices dependent on it, like IP cameras, command and control servers, anything, for up to two blocks, depending on the uh, wireless network adapter that you use. Doing that with hardware would be illegal, and doing it with software is arguably illegal. Uh, it's part of why uh, being able to get handshakes is a little bit con a little bit controversial. Because in order to do that, you have to disconnect the other person for just a moment, which is technically you're not supposed to be doing. So that is one thing to note. A lot of these tools are used by hackers because they're not totally legal, and you should always check before using any of these. Should have said that at the beginning. So it is possible to jam Wi-Fi. In fact, it's a tactic that's extremely effective because it forces the user to do something. If you are in a co-working space and you want to attack a whole bunch of people with a lot of wealth, you can simply just call them off the internet, force them to connect something, and conduct all of their business, including banking arrangements, financial transactions, everything through this fake network, gather everything, and end up doing a lot of damage. So it's important to note that if you suddenly lose access to a Wi-Fi network, you've always had access to it, and suddenly there's all these new alternatives around you, it could be for any reason. Um, next up, Tim is going to be going into this a bit, but we have rogue devices like the USB rubber ducky. Once you have physical access, all bets are off. If you can plug in a device to a computer when nobody is, is looking and the device is un the computer is unlocked, if somebody steps away on the phone for a second because you call them, if somebody has an emergency they need to take care of, or if they leave for a second, you can plug in a device that will bypass all of the security you could possibly set because it thinks it's you using a keyboard. So bypassing. Uh, Bypassing the Wi-Fi entirely with Ethernet is also a tactic you can do, as well as just repitting the entire router. So if you upload custom firmware to the router, so it is running your program instead of theirs, you can also kind of bypass the entire process of needing to uh, know the Wi-Fi password. So advanced persistent threats are the last uh, kind of group that we'll cover. These are nation states. These are people who have cyber weapons. These are not people that are using commercial products to do testing. These are people that are looking to smash shit. Uh, the reason that they are doing that is because they have resources like personnel, money, processing power, nation-state backing, and access to military-grade cyber weapons, and they have very specific agendas. Each one of these people, is kind of, each one of these groups is out to do something. So because of that, uh, you don't see a lot of minor players in this group, and you don't see people that are kind of getting into your Wi-Fi to like do some tame stuff. Like These are the only people that are operating weaponry that is real and is something that the world kind of hasn't really seen before. So when we talk about uh, who these people are, again, it's nation states, intelligence agencies, hacktivist collectives, terrorist organizations, criminal enterprises, and increasingly criminal proxies and intelligence services. What that means is hackers will get caught, but they won't get put out of business. Instead, intelligence agencies will use them to do various things so that things don't get traced back to them. So for example, if they're caught hacking into the Pentagon, then a Russian hacker being sent to jail for that is a lot easier than a, you know, a military officer being caught doing that. So uh, the signature of an APT attacker is they have a huge toolkit to choose from. Most smart threats will use what they know. They will use what is comfortable. They will use what has worked before. But an APT hacker can use things that are exact. They will pick the exact right exploit that works exactly correct for the exact situation they're using. And that is their signature, the fact that they have such a wide toolkit to draw from. Um, they use many zero-day vulnerabilities, which is something uh, that basically means nobody else knows that this vulnerability exists, and therefore you cannot defend against it. Microsoft does not know. The, the vendors do not know because the government keeps it a secret to basically power these kinds of weapons. Um, they are highly focused on you know, achieving focus, uh, certain goals, and they are capable of actually causing widespread death and destruction. Uh, we're talking about disrupting infrastructure, critical things like power, electricity, water, gas that would actually cause people to die if it were to go down. So this is not the kind of thing where you know they're just trying to like prank us. These are things that in a times of war would actually be real things to think about. Um, so attacks used by ATPs are going to be zero-day frameworks. That is vulnerabilities that have not been disclosed. Uh, implants, which is actually putting hardware into things before they get to you. And cyber weapons, like uh, you might have heard of WannaCry, um, things like that. 
So when you do not know about a vulnerability, you cannot hope to protect against it, and that is the essence of a cyber weapon. Um, things like the broad pawn, broad pawn vulnerability, uh, which was released a little bit before DEF CON, were actually a flaw in the firmware of the chip that runs Wi-Fi on almost everyone in this room's phone. So because of that, and it was not patched uh, up until when DEF CON, a little bit before DEF CON was announced, if you had your Wi-Fi on, not connected, but on, and walk by somebody who was running this exploit, they could run arbitrary code on your phone, which is insane. Because you have no way of combating that. There's no, I mean, aside from just turning off Wi-Fi, which is a good idea, by the way, um, there's not really a way of getting around that, and that's dangerous. So it's important people know that there are ways of doing, kind of breaking into Wi-Fi that are much more advanced than kind of the other things I've covered. Cherry Tree is a really interesting, I'm not gonna get too much into it, but it is the CIA kind of uh, program to be able to break into routers and use them as espionage networks. And it is kind of the final pinnacle of breaking into a network, taking over the router, and dropping in something to do your bidding. It is the kind of grand architect of that kind of thing. So if you're more interested in like what advanced attacks look like in this kind of scope, Cherry Tree is something you might want to look up. Uh, and finally, if agencies have access to supercomputers, your passwords are laughed at by supercomputers. Um, so finally, I just want to show some uh, real tools attackers use. Uh, attackers use Tally Linux. They use wireless network adapters. So this is again for Wi-Fi hacking. Uh, Linux-based systems like Arch Linux, uh, Parrot OS. Uh, we like to use drones. The Raspberry Pi is a really popular uh, platform this, for this sort of thing because the aforementioned Linux systems run on this and it's really, really easy to get started on something cheap and kind of see the way that this stuff works. In addition to that, it's really, really difficult to know who is behind an attack from a Raspberry Pi. It could be a seven-year-old, or it could be a spy. You don't know. The point is, anybody could buy one, they cost $35, and they could cause a lot of damage in the right hands. So other low-cost, low-power devices are also frequently used for this, and uh, the reason this is starting to happen is the decrease in build costs is making computers more like munitions and less like sunk investments. So when you think of losing a $10 computer that can attack a network, pivot through it, and take down a million dollar corporation, again, this is a $10 computer, it doesn't matter. In the scope of a penetration test and the, the kind of budget that most of these people have, it does not matter to lose a $10 computer. And that means something very new for how we look at these kinds of hardware-based attacks, like uh, dropping one of these nearby a business and leaving a trash can for a couple days and being able to breach their network. That's a very real possibility with the kind of devices that are on the market today and easily available. So finally, uh, at the end of the talk, uh, Wi-Fi is a liability if you don't know anything about it. If you use Wi-Fi, you should be aware that many people will actively seek to exploit a vulnerable or misconfigured network. If you make yourself a target, I hope you now see that it is actually super valuable for the right people. So by understanding what these problems look like, it's the only way that we can identify and build a stronger infrastructure because most businesses use Wi-Fi. Most businesses do not know these things. Most businesses are not going to invest in kind of fixing these things until something bad happens. It's a really bad habit. It's how business works, but it's not a sustainable way of doing this. So you guys are CS majors. The reason why I picked this topic is now you guys are all a little bit more aware of uh, what these things are. If you go into businesses now that have Wi-Fi misconfigured and they are just like, what's the worst thing that can happen? You now have a presentation right, on uh, the various different things that can go wrong and the various different people that would actually seek to exploit this kind of thing. So if you're interested more about Wi-Fi hacking, we have a lot of really good tutorials on Nullbyte uh, for Wi-Fi exploitation and ethical hacking. So we hope that you'll come back to more talks like this and also check us out on Nullbyte at wonderhut2.com. Right. Thanks, guys.